Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie Romano, and I'm one of the regional paramedic educators with SWARP. Uh, today, we're actually doing something a little different with our rounds and webinar presentation. We are actually doing this live in Lambton County. We have a group of paramedics in the classroom presentation on uh, cryptothyrotomy review, presented by uh, Dwayne Cattell, regional paramedic educator, and Samir Mao, PGY4 in emergency medicine. I'd also like to send regrets for online, so if we do have questions for Dr. Duke, we'll definitely show you the demonstration of it right. Uh, Thank you very much, Steph. All right, so welcome everyone who's in person and welcome to everyone online. Hopefully everyone can be calm uh, reflexive enough so you don't need to think about it. Uh, in terms of the overview of our talk, uh, we're going to start with the, uh, talking about BVM uh, before we jump into the Craig stuff. Uh, and then Dwayne will take over the talk uh, once we get into some of the complicated airway attempt or when it's just unmanageable and then we need to go that next step and do the needle crank. Uh, we're going to talk about the indications, the contraindications. Uh, we're going to review uh, uh, crank on a mannequin here and we're going to go step by step. Our you know, preconceived notions are of endo endotracheal intubation or even cricothyrotomies. They are much sexier skills, but it's really BVM or BMB, whatever you want to call it. That is your cornerstone airway skill. That's where you have to perform a cricothyrotomy. Initially kind of taught, brought into emergentology from the anesthesia uh, literature and, and their uh, experiences in the operating room. It's important to hold the mask and the other to either uh, to bag or to change the settings. EVM ventilation is thought to be uh, and, and very difficult in, in at least one third of those populations. And the other thing you have to keep in mind is the patients that emerge docs, and just intuitively this makes sense. You're using your stronger fingers then to lift up the uh, mandible towards the maxilla. So what you instead of using your three weakest fingers, you're using your two thumbs and your palms to secure them. It, it allows maximal maneuverability of the mask as well, surrounding it on, on, surrounding it on each side, versus the CE technique where half of your half of your mask is is essentially unmanipulatable, if that's a word, I don't know. Um, policeman, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. The skillful part is actually holding the bag. So apply the mask with the bag attached to something I found useful. Your system put the bag on top. Uh, the other uh, the other tech uh, adjuncts, you're, you're doing a one-hand bag, it's just not working. Insert and it will definitely save me a handful of times and given me more time to just set up for my next intubation attempt, which is what, which is what we're really trying to do. So this is something to keep in your bags. So Hopefully we can get some practice with that. Uh, has a lot of benefits. Um, they deliver air directly to the glottis. Here's a pic. Uh, the next slide actually will have a picture of what a king looks like when it's actually in the mouth. Um, so hopefully, if your BVM isn't working, this is you're trying to manipulate, trying to get that position going, and it's not working. Your jaw thrusting. Then you move on. Okay, well, I'm going to go to my uh, my king, and you. Measure up, put your king in appropriately, you try airway, uh, reflex it. Being able to recognize the situation where that's your only option left to, to play is, is very important. So if you can't intubate, my BBM's not working. There's practice because it's it's a high risk, like relatively zero uh, times that when the situation does call for it, that you're prepared and ready to go. Absolutely. So it's it's a you know, if you think about the situation that you're going to be in with this, you have a patient who's becoming more and more hypoxic and grinding down. They're dying in front of you. You can't bag them. You can't fit a king in. Maybe they have an upper airway obstruction. You can't intubate them. So now you're, you're called upon all of a sudden to do a procedure that you're not comfortable with. You rarely, rarely do. You have to do it as quickly as possible. And everyone's anxiety is through the roof. You, your partner, your family, it's just it's it's a nightmare scenario. So I, I just to go back, I really want to stress some of the original skills that we talked about with BBM and with Kings, because quite often when we reach a situation like this, you know, it, it's very easy and reflexive to say, Oh, that was a failure of intubation. That was the reason they went down that pathway. But in essence, if you think about it, it's really a failure of ventilation because that that's that's your safety net, that's your fail safe. So think of Really practice your BBM techniques. Sorry, we'll jump back to that, but it, it, it's very, very important. Uh, so the crite, guys, what is it exactly? Um, <clears throat> to secure our airway when everything else has failed. Okay, this is our last ditch effort. We're going to try and secure this. This is the last trick we have in our bag. Okay, remember the cannulation is going to take uh, place below the glottis. 
Okay, you're going to be trying to hit the cranial fiber and membrane. Uh, different types out there. There's uh, surgical and needle, uh, percutaneous uh, transtracheal ventilation. And remember, it is a temporary procedure, um, like less than an hour that this person like to this crank to be in place. Uh, it's it's a life saving emergency cranial uh, uh, fibrotomy. That's what it is. And the percutaneous trans tracheal ventilation is just the type of ventilation that we use once our cricothyrotomy is in place. We'll be talking about that uh, later on in the talk. Okay. So uh, differences in uh, positioning. Remember, your cricothyrotomy, you want to go through the uh, cricothyroid membrane, whereas a trach or a stoma, a tracheostomy site, is going to be lower than that. You're going to be below the uh, cricothyroid curvature. That's usually done uh, surgically if yeah. implanted. Yeah. That's yeah. The, Cricothyrotomy, so you've probably seen people with trachs before, so that, that's just the obvious difference. A crake is below the crank cartilage, and, uh, sorry, a, I said that wrong. A cricothyrotomy is above the cricoid cartilage, and a tracheotomy is below the cricoid cartilage. Uh, the reason we do cricothyrotomies in an emergency versus a tracheotomy is that it does offer a few benefits. It's much faster, it's safer, there's fewer things to do. Just think of your, your neck anatomy, there's a lot of things going on there. You have your great vessels of the neck, you have your esophagus, you have your trachea, your thyroid glands, parathyroid glands. There's a lot of things you can hit. Uh, the instances of complications with cricothyrotomy, because they can be done percutaneously, is lower than emergent tracheostomies. Uh, so you, you, you avoid some of the dangerous structures going up in the cricothyroid membrane that you would otherwise be at greater risk of hitting if you went lower down. The big disadvantages of a cricothyrotomy is that they're smaller in size, like we will we'll demonstrate uh, later on here. We're using a 14 gauge angiopath versus a big trach to, to, uh, to ventilate these people. So that's why it's a temporary procedure. We talk about probably upwards of an hour that you can uh, uh, ventilate someone effectively with a cricothyrotomy, but once that patient reaches hospital, that will have to be converted uh, into a different airway. Uh, and a cricothyrotomy you cannot convert into a tracheotomy, though those patients will subsequently need to have an open trach done under the operating room or the ICU. So when we talk about the relative anatomy, uh, upper airway anatomy, we start talking about our curlages and, and our larynx. Um, and we have uh, nine curlages and six are paired and three are unpaired. So if you're working uh, superiorly to inferiorly, um, the thyroid curlage, and then the arachnoids are below that, and then, then you have your cricothyroid membrane, and that's a spot we want to hit with our uh, craig needle, and then uh, our cricoid cartilage is at the bottom, and they're uncared, uh, but our cricothyroid membrane is that, that soft spot, that, uh, that, uh, that almost fibrous, and that's where we want to uh, penetrate the needle. And again, the, the, this is going to be an emergency situation, someone's dying in front of you, we don't want to complicate it too much by having you think of all these different cartilages, which one's paired, which one's not. This is just useful background information. When we actually get down to the technique, we'll give you the simplest version possible that you can just jump straight to and not have to think about this actively while you're, while you're doing it. Okay, guys, so our directive. Um, Cricothyroid, uh, cricothyrotomy, uh, needle break directive, um, auxiliary directive, and um, so what are our conditions? Uh, the patient needs an advanced airway, okay? And everything else has failed, your tubing has failed, your king has failed, you're unable to ventilate based on that. Um, the conditions, they have to be 12 years of age and greater, um, then level of awareness has to be altered, unconscious, that sort of thing. Uh, the contraindications, uh, fractured larynx, okay? If you're not, you're not gonna be able to landmark, the anatomy is gonna be all distorted, Okay, and uh, and the inability just to landmark it, that they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, it is a patch point. We have to call in for this. Um, it, it is a mandatory patch point we need in order to do this. This is when everything else has failed and nothing's working. So this would be a situation where if everything's failed, uh, partner number one preps the neck with some alcohol swabs, partner number two right away at the same time is jumping on the phone to get a hold of a base hospital physician to go ahead with the order. Uh, in terms of confirming uh, after you've done the cricothyrotomy, uh, you need to confirm it with two primary and one secondary method. Uh, if the patient has a pulse and total carbon dioxide must be used and placement must be confirmed immediately after each patient transfer floor to stretcher, stretcher to EMS stretcher to hospital 
cervical stretcher just because uh, we're just using a little angiocap. It's very easy for those catheters to get kinked or misplaced. So anytime a patient's being moved, make sure you're rechecking placement. All right, finally, the actual procedure, what we're all here for. Okay, uh, depending on what the service is utilizing, there's different ones. Uh, where we are at Lambton, we are using uh, needle cricle thyrotomies. Um, other services across the problem, there's different procedures. Some do surgical airways where they actually cut into the cricothyroid membrane, past that endotracheal tube, break through the neck. Um, there are places that use what's called the quick treat, and it's just kind of, it's a, it's a wonderful place. You just kind of slam it into place, and the, the large uh, lumen just pushes through the cartilage. It's a, it's a true emergency uh, rescue crank. Um, and then there's um, the surgical insertion, uh, sorry, the, uh, the melker which is a Selinger technique uh, with a guide wire and sliding uh, uh, sliding the airway in through an incision. The needle crank has a lot of advantages and that you'll, you'll see in the next few slides in that uh, it has a minimal amount of steps, minimal amount, minimal amount of equipment, So, and, and that's what we want. When, you're, when we're in a situation where we're forced to do this, you want something that's as easy as possible with as few steps as possible so you don't really need to think about it. So uh, specific for Lambda Chem EMS uh, with our needle crank, so do our, our BLS care, our ABCs, uh, try to manage the airway if, it, if it's a four. You're going to run into this with a four body air obstruction is probably the number one reason. Um, with that, uh, you know, adjust as necessary, try to ventilate, doing your chest thrusts, trying to clear the airway suction as necessary, um, and then, you know, trying to get the king in if the king doesn't work trying to intubate, uh, the intubation doesn't work, everything else has failed, and then from that point, stabilize the head and the neck into like a neutral alignment. Okay, you need to start palpating down, trying to find the cricothyroid membrane. Okay, uh, swab the area clean, get your equipment prepped, okay, and then get on the phone and get the order for it or ask for the order for the break. So the most common indication that you'll probably be doing this procedure as a paramedic would be either an airway, an upper airway foreign body, or a severe upper airway infection like a retropharyngeal abscess or a bad Ludwig's angina. Those are probably, probably the most um, most common uses of, of a crike in the pre-hospital world here. In hospital, because we paralyze patients often when we intubate, that's another uh, route that we is another we go down in case we paralyze someone and subsequently can't intubate your mentally, but that's not something obviously that uh, you guys want to worry about. So as far as equipment, um, get your equipment set up. Um, we're going to go through this in a few minutes. Uh, get a 10cc syringe. You can either fill it half full of water or not. Uh, it just shows as you're aspirating for free air. Uh, get your 14-gauge, uh, 14 14-18-gauge 14 gauge catheter, about, Bigger two the better. Long, about two inches long. Okay, get that all connected, get all that ready to go, have all your equipment prepared, your BBM, everything ready to go. From here, you're going to palpate down. Okay, you're going to go down the cartilage. You're kind of look for the Adam's apple, so that big, that big thyroid cartilage, and usually if you kind of step down. I was always told it was kind of a step down, and you'll find that cricothyroid membrane. It's like a little V shape, almost like a, almost like a smiley face. Okay. Once you have that, swab that site, uh, grab the and secure, uh, secure the trach because in, in the environment you could be in a pretty wild environment and uh, people moving around, you don't want to lose that. You want you to have that landmark in your, you have your visual landmark. So uh, again, just to go over that, uh, you want to stabilize the midline of the patient. Often people are flailing around. This is a this is a nightmare scenario. So really stabilize the the Adam's apple, if you want to call it that, uh, or the thyroid cartilage. And, uh, the easiest thing, forget about all that fancy anatomy you talked about earlier. Grab the midline with your index finger. Just palpate for the thyroid notch, which is that little V on top of your Adam's apple, and then just slide down uh, over the cricothyroid membrane. You'll feel uh, you'll feel a little gap below the thyroid cartilage before you feel palpate the cricoid cartilage, that's where you want to go. So just grab the midline. Uh, you can't really hurt someone if you're going going in the midline. Uh, the higher you are, the safer you are, just like I talked about before. A lot of the uh, scary structures, like especially lung, great vessels, are a bit, li little lower down. Uh, so grab the midline, go higher, go in the middle, and then just uh, aspirate for air. Uh, from here, once you have your catheter all attached, you know where you're going, it's, it's clean, it's aseptic. Insert the, uh, insert the IV catheter, okay? Uh, about 45 degree angle, it's hard because the chin's in the way. 
Okay, so at about 45 degree angle, you're going to go in a little bit. Um, you'll aspirate for free air. Okay, so that's a lot of people tend to use water in the syringe. So you can see the bubbles coming up. At least you know you're in a space where there is air. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, once your free air is present, then you insert a little bit more, sort of like starting on just a little bit more, just to confirm, and then you're going to be sliding the catheter down as you're withdrawing the needle, and it slides down nice and gently into place. Remove the needle, dispose of the sharps. Yeah. Um, now, there's different ways you can do it. You can either utilize, uh, with a 14-gauge catheter, they will accommodate a number three endotracheal tube adapter. You can plug it right in. Uh, one of the methods I uh, was taught uh, was actually take a number seven endotracheal tube adapter, take a 3cc syringe, take off the needle and the plunger, and just push that in there, and it fits right in. Screw it on to the catheter itself, and then from there, start your ventilating and start your confirmation process. So you can see from the picture, our initial 10cc syringe with the needle is out. We've replaced that with a smaller 3cc syringe without the saline in it. No, saline for people's not. Uh, take the saline out, put your uh, number 7 ETT connector on top, the 3cc syringe and the number 7 connector fit uh, nice and snug together, and then you can attach your BBM on top. So to do this procedure, we're simple as possible. We're using things that are already in your bag, nothing fancy, uh, and uh, in just in a, in a few quick steps, you can have an effective airway. So some of the clinical pearls, guys, uh, positioning of the patient. Um, we may have the patients that are really hyperextended, the, the kyphotic patients, the short necks, that sort of thing, uh, which can pose a problem. Uh, make sure your equipment's set up. Like with any procedure, we get all our equipment laid out, ready to go when we determine, yes, I'm going, I'm walking down this path. So we get all our equipment set up. Um, the lighting in the, in, in the houses or wherever we're doing this on the side of the road, okay, make sure you have some type of light so you at least you can see what you're doing. It's very important. Uh, the, Use your partner. Use your partner. Get them to swap a site. Get them to get things set out for you. Maintain stabilization in line. Get your BVM opened up. Get it hooked up to your uh, to your oxygen. Okay, and have your suction readily available. And try to utilize that first, as uh, Smear said, like you know, BLS first. Try to clear the airway like that. Yeah, and then just with the positioning, it's going to be a very difficult procedure if you're trying to do this when someone's neck is flexed. Uh, just a little clinical pearl, put them in full extension. It helps bring the airway up more superficial, so it'll be a little bit easier to palpate the structures that you're going for. Uh, and then just the rest, preparedness, to have your assistant really help out. Uh, this shouldn't be a too, too bloody a procedure because we're using a needle technique, but it is good to have your, your suction there uh, and use good light. Um, generally with a crank, uh, as we said before, it's only in for about an hour. It requires high ventilation pressures. Now, I'm not sure how many, uh, what services carry jet ventilators, okay, uh, I know we don't, but I mean, we, we can still accomplish this with a BVM, just noting that you are trying to push this in, and it's going to be a slow process, it's going to be a couple seconds in, and you need to wait that time, like the 8 to 10 seconds to allow that air to escape, okay, if you need, if you want to prevent barrel trauma, that's the thing, you, you don't want to force this too hard. Uh, you may have to gently compress the chest to get the air out, depending on the situation. Um, you know, and watch your patient, watch your patient, watch your patient. Very, very important. Uh, yeah, so like Dwayne said, use a ratio of about 1 to 8 uh, when, you're, when you're banging these people. Uh, and the amount of air you're delivering forward into the lungs is dependent on a few things, including the patient's inspiratory pressure. They have really high inspiratory pressures. You're not going to be getting much air forward. Uh, how long uh, you uh, squeeze the bag for will obviously determine it. The airway resistance, which is determined by catheter size, uh, will, will affect how much air is delivered into the lung and lung compliance, of course. This is a less effective technique for ventilating patients than doing it through an endotracheal tube. And the reason for this is about one-third of the air that you're pushing forward with, forward with your bag actually goes retrograde up through the glottis and out your mouth and your nose. Um, so that's just another reason why this isn't your best airway technique. This is your last resort airway technique. Okay, uh, so some of the advantages. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very low risk of all the um, 
out of all the surgical area procedures, this is the lowest risk for inadvertent needle sticks uh, to the patient. Uh, that's that's our main focus. Hey, uh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah. Um, we, you do not, you will not compromise C spine control if taken in. This is a trauma situation. Okay, um, you know, with practice, this can be accomplished in uh, a timely fashion, quickly, uh, and it, it does work. It is effective. Like we said, only for about an hour. That's the length, like the time before they need sometimes something surgically done, uh, and it's relatively inexpensive. Catheter the surgeons. Uh, some of the disadvantages: uh, the airway is not. It's not a definitive airway. That's the thing. Right? It's not a definitive airway. It's not protected 100%. Um, it does promote oxygenation. However, that's why we have that with the expiratory phase. We need that time to get that carbon dioxide out of there. Okay. And here. that's why Duane was saying squeeze the chest earlier as well because you're not getting effect, essentially an effective expiratory phase. Uh, so if you find your bag get a little bit more difficult, just give their chest a squeeze with, with the bag attached. They're not getting they're not things, they're not getting the volume. Their lung volumes, they're not expanding the chest as far as what we would normally do with an intricate tube or a king or something spontaneously breathing. Um, it's hard because the lumen size is so small in the catheter. Okay, we're we're doing what we can. Um, slow expansion and relaxation of the chest wall, um, and that's you just have to deal with that in this situation. We really don't have really can't do a lot about it. Um, air trapping can result, and that's why just nice and easy when we're bagging. Uh, if you're overzealous with the bagging, uh, that's when problems will arise. So some of the uh, complications, we've discussed this a bit, uh, the marrow trauma, obviously we have to be very careful when we're, we're bagging them and with our time with releasing of air. Right, you're, you're revved up. You, you, just, you just, you saw someone dying or dead in front of you, you've got emergency airway in, your first reflex instinct would just be to keep bagging and bagging and bagging that patient. That's where you can get into a lot of trouble with, with the marrow trauma. So you, you need to be cognizant of that. Uh, as far as the catheter issues, uh, probably one of the biggest things is the kinking of the catheter. Uh, and if it's not kind of taped in place and secured, the catheter can become dislodged. And then you've done done your first crank ever and it was working fine and now the catheter's out. That sucks. Um, yeah. Inadvertent, uh, you know, puncturing going on, which could lead to subcutaneous emphysema. If you go through the trach uh, and you get subcutaneous emphysema in the neck, okay, we want to watch that. If you are getting subcutaneous emphysema, that doesn't necessarily mean you're in the wrong spot. It is very common to see subcutaneous emphysema after this procedure. Uh, but just re recheck the syringe with water is, is a great idea. Just make sure you're not getting blood back or something like that. Uh, the hypercapnia, obviously from the gas exchange, we're not getting uh, the gases out, uh, the oxide and that out, and we need to be cognizant, we need a long expiratory phase, long expiratory phase. Uh, damage to adjacent structures if you went through, if you went through the trach and then through and then the esophagus, well, that's not a place we want to be. There's a lot of things in that air in your neck that you can hit, which is why I had to stress we'll go over this again. Just grab the midline, grab the thyroid cartilage, palpate for the beam, slide down. You're not going to hurt someone if you go midline, but if you're way out to the side, you have lots of different things you can hit. Uh, your jugulars, your carotids, uh, esophagus, thyroid glands, so stay in the middle. And as always, uh, bleeding and down the road infection. All right, so this, to summarize kind of the, the first part of our talk, the didactic part, Good BVM technique is absolutely critical to airway success, and, and I, I really uh, encourage all you guys to practice both the one-hand technique and the two-hand technique, because this is going to save you. It's your, it's your safety net from going down this airway nightmare pathway of eventually having to, to poke someone's neck. Uh, the rescue air, airway devices are very easy to insert. Uh, they can help uh, in, in your prevent your worst case scenario, so have those ready and available uh, any time that you're attempting an endotracheal intubation in the field. Recognize a failed airway. Uh, quite often we, we see this in hospital where people spend too long uh, going for their endotracheal tube. Uh, now we have a, a limit of two, uh, two attempts uh, in the field with, with paramedics, but once you, you can't do that and you can't bag, realize right away that, okay, I have no other option in this scenario. 30 seconds away from the hospital, you can just jet. You're now stuck. You need to go 
to your next step, which is the crank. And then lastly, practice till it becomes reflective. reflective. This is something you want to do the least amount of thinking of. You want this to just kind of happen when you're called upon to do it. Right? It's not going to be very often in your careers, but uh, when it does come up, you just want to be able to do it as quickly as possible. So that's it for the first part of our talk. Um, now, we'll, Dwayne will take us through a demonstration on our mannequin here. We'll turn our camera around so we can see that uh, up close. And please feel free to ask the questions. Actually, Samir, I have a couple questions that were submitted online. Uh, first one is, what are your thoughts on a second catheter for exhalation? A second catheter for so we, I, I want to keep this as simple as possible. We have, you don't want to be sticking multiple things in people's necks. The cricothyroid membrane is, it's not a big target as it is. Stick one needle in. This is an effective technique for up to an hour. So I don't, I don't think we need to worry about putting second catheters in. When you're in this situation, once your crank is in place, head towards hospital. You will be able to sustain someone for upwards of an hour with this technique. So I would recommend staying away from poking more needles into a neck and risking further complications. Okay, great. Uh, second question, and the last one so far online, is would a crank be appropriate for a hanging patient? So this type of patient would be collared, making intubation difficult, as well as a possible King LT. Or would this fit under the contraindication of a suspected fracture of the larynx? I think that's. I think that would be the call of the of the medic. Remember, we treat hangings as a medical cardiac arrest. Now, the contraindications: if you can't palpate the structures, okay, or if you think the larynx is fractured. I mean, if you, if you look at it and part of it's over here, part of it just put the crank stuff back in the bag. Don't even don't even bother. I, it's it's going to be a judgment call on behalf of the medic. I really, really. And depending how successful the person was with their hanging attempt, the, the structures you're going for will probably be distorted. So my, my gut feeling in that situation would be that would probably be a contraindication. But again, it, it's, it's a judgment call. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Uh, so my apologies for the background. The video has frozen a few times, so we've instead gone to the PowerPoint full screen. For the demonstration, though, we're going to try the video again. Um, so hopefully that works for you this time, guys. So, All right. Right back to you. Sorry. Oh, sorry, Quite there's another yeah, question. Um, what kind of, uh, you know, call for it in the case of a BSA patient? I know, you know, that's a critical patient anyways, but we've got other management priorities too. Uh, and generally, we're saying now these days, yeah. don't rely on endotracheal innovation right away. But let's say we do have a failed airway. Uh, we do have IV access, and we're kind of getting a lot of gastric constipation, that kind of thing. Is there really any sort of call for it immediately because you're suspecting you're getting some air entry, but you're worried about possible aspiration of gastric dissipation on that stuff. Un unless it was your feeling that the arrest was caused by the upper airway obstruction that's uh, precluding you from doing performing effective BVM or inserting an SGA, I would say no for a cricothyrotomy and strictly a PSA patient uh, of another cause. Um, yeah, that's yeah. It's, it's mostly to do with the foreign body air obstruction. You know, the ones that are still alive, and you're trying to clear. You're doing your chest thrust, you're positioning your suction, and, and you know, you think, okay, okay, well, you know, King's not going to go. And you take a look with your scope. You have your McGill's, and you're you don't see anything. And you're like, oh, okay, now we're at that point, right? And that's this is the this is the last. This is the end of the road. Yeah. And there, like you said, there's so many other priorities you have in in an arrest. See, compressions, 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 that uh, unless you think the arrest is caused by the error obstruction, I would stay away from cracking the BSA patients. Um, actually, one more comment online here so far. Um, a comment, potentially an idea. Uh, what about the possibility of using IV extension tubing on the catheter when using a C collar? Could that be potentially easier to secure if possible? So now you're, well, what you're doing by, by by increasing the length of, if you if you put an IV tube in, you're increasing the length of, uh, you're increasing the full length of, of the air to eventually get into the trachea. If you rewind back to physics, that's going to increase your air, airway resistance. This isn't a big airway as it is. I would absolutely avoid that. Okay, great. You're, you're dead space. Absolutely. Good. Any questions in the room at, the, at this moment? Okay, great. So we'll move on to the demonstration, and uh, as far as right now, the video is working, so great. we're good to go. Okay, guys. 
So, of course, you know, uh, PPE is a big thing. Get your gloves on, get your mask on, if necessary, goggles, that sort of thing. It shouldn't be too messy of a procedure. So, get all your equipment prepped. Um, your tapes are ripped, your BVM is ready to do thing. Um, so, you're here and now you're, oh, you're able to landmark. So, we're in the midline. We found the uh, thyroid cartilage and we stepped down and we know where the cricoid thyroid membrane is. So, from here, you can actually use your partner. Uh, you can have your partner go ahead and he can swab that up. And then while I'm getting my equipment prepared, and we just grab like a 10 cc syringe, okay? Um, you don't have to fill it full of water. However, it's, it's, a nice, uh, it's a nice indicator of that, yes, I'm in the right spot. You see bubbles when you go to here. Okay, 14 gauge. Essentially putting an IV into it. 10 cc syringe. Screw that on into place. From here, your BVM gets hooked up. And what you're going to do is start to ventilate. And what you're looking for, you're going to look for some chest rise. You'll have your stethoscope on, and you'll be auscultating your consistent waveform. Uh, you can do, do the qualitative, or you can do the quantitative method. Uh, just hold that up here. And we have a hand, and as we from the floor to the stretcher, waveform, that sort of thing. You move on, you're going to check it again and again and again. Anytime there's a big patient movement, sort of almost like the way we treat an endotracheal tube. Every big movement. We make sure it hasn't become dislodged. And it's even more important here because we're needle crank. Um, is you can use a number of sites, right? So for those online, the question was, would you ever tegaderm? Um, yeah. Sort of the, the microphone might not be so sensitive to questions in here, so nice and loud would be great. Uh, but again, the question was, would you tegaderm? Absolutely. Holding it is cabinet. Does your service use the easy I.O.? The I.O. devices? Yes. Uh, yeah. Do you have any I.O. Yeah, yeah. For yeah. adults. We don't have standing orders for adults. Are there any other questions either in class or to put your hand up using uh, the webinar hands up device? Uh, or you can ask questions just by typing them in the question box and then I'm more than happy to read them. Just give it a few more seconds to see if anyone has any other Oh, that one I'll address uh, just by typing it back. Um, any other questions? Anyone would like to put their hand up at all for the webinar? Anything in class? Okay, great. I'd like to call Fit Fate.